welcome everybody who's who's on online and watching us at this uh, Zoom meeting to the 16th annual Cottle Lectureship. Um, that is uh, that is a feature of the medical education group uh, and the committee at the Worcester District Medical Society, uh, which is led by Mary O'Brien for the last, I think, four years now, right, Mary? Um, and tonight's uh, talker is going to be, and the lecture is going to be, Hugh Silk, who's going to talk to us about stories, art, music, and photographs and reducing burnout and improving patient care through the medical humanities. Now, at Worcester District Medical Society, we're lucky that uh, Dr. Lewis Cottle um, has supplied us with a, a, basically an endowment to promote medical education for the practicing uh, community. And Dr. Cottle came to Worcester in 1902, uh, fresh from his training at Boston City Hospital, and established himself as the president of the Worcester Emergency uh, Hospital, which uh, he led as president for uh, for 48 years until he finally died in 1950. I'm not sure whether he worked his way to the bitter end or not, but he certainly left a, a, a large imprint in Worcester medicine and a great legacy going forward, which even to this day now, 75 years, almost 75 years after he's, he's died is having an impact. Um, uh, Mary O'Brien, who is going to uh, introduce the speaker in the evening and describe some of our rule, rules of engagement, I guess, tonight, uh, is the uh, is the chair of the committee on medical education, and on her behalf, I'm going to thank all the people who who are on that committee and acknowledge their efforts to to come to this point tonight. Doctors Abruzzo, Cooper, Feshner, Glazer, <laughs> Koala, Hui, Leb, Lindbergh, Lockery, and Potts, uh, and our student members uh, Sassy Schick and Bennett Vogt. Vogt. But really, the, the prime mover on this, as I well know, is, is uh, Mary, uh, who is an associate professor of medicine at UMass Memorial, uh, where she did her training uh, and uh, went on faculty and is uh, now not only chair of our medical education committee, but also chair of uh, the uh, um, discovery curriculum at UMass. So we've redone the whole uh, curriculum at UMass um, uh, which is a, uh, has been a real feat and used up an awful lot of people's energies and time. Uh, and she's recently promoted to associate professor of, uh, of medicine. So really, I think uh, a great thing. And so Mary, I'm going to ask you to take it away now and introduce Dr. Silk and uh, lead us on. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Whalen. Um, I would, I have the distinct pleasure tonight to introduce you to Dr. Hugh Silk, our 2022 Cotta Lecture Speaker. Dr. Silk is a professor and a vice professor chair of community health chair. in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. His clinical work is with the Road to Care at UMass Memorial Health in Worcester. He is also a UMass Medical School Learning Communities Mentor in the Blackstone House. He's instructor at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Harvard Medical School, and he's co-PI for the Center of Integration of Primary Care and Oral Health. Dr. Silk is also co-founder and co-chair of the UMass Medical Humanities Lab and teaches students and residents using the Worcester Art Museum. In addition, he is the co-section editor for sharing our stories in metahumanities for family system and health. He has written and published poems and stories in several medical and medical humanities journals, blogs, and writing contests, and is the Families, Systems, and Health Journal Sharing Our Stories Department co-editor. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Silk, who will be speaking to us tonight on stories, art, music, and photographs, reducing burnout, and improving patient care through the medical humanities. Welcome, Dr. Silk. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. There's been so many great speakers over the years. I hope I can live up to that. Okay, uh, so, so my plan here is to cover a number of slides. Uh, I, I, I've, I've gotten used to giving slides over the years. It's a bit of a crutch, I think. 
So bear with me, but I think some of it will be images and some of it will be information. Uh, and I don't have any disclosures. Um, and my goals for tonight are really to get you to think a little bit about how the medical humanities can help you practice better medicine. So I think some of that is noticing more, understanding where our patients are coming from, offering them resources of medical humanities, believe it or not, and how the medical humanities can also help you thrive. Um, I don't think we do enough self-gratitude, but I think that has become a thing to not only prevent burnout, but to really thrive in medicine, and then to get some enjoyment outside of work. Uh, not everything has to be just filtered back to medicine. Maybe just uh, looking up and noticing will, will be good unto itself. If you have any uh, thoughts or questions along the way, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'll try and monitor the chat here on my phone. And uh, and I'm going to ask a few questions along the way. So I'd love if you if you participated through chat and at one point even unmuting yourself. So I'll get to that in a second. So wh why the humanities for me? I actually uh, come from a non-traditional medical background. I didn't I didn't do pre-med. Um, I studied political science, and uh, throughout my, my studies, I met this gentleman here, Robert Coles, and he's a child psychiatrist um, by training, but was very interested in literature. He, he and I, I was, I was fortunate enough to teach a course with him called the Literature of Social Medicine at Harvard University for a few years, and he introduced me to these kinds of books, um, really getting at uh, what is it like to be a sharecropper? What is it like to be from down south? What is it like to um, be a, uh, a miner uh, in England? And I think it was this book here, William Carlos Williams, when I really started to think about not only what is it like to be a, a physician, but, but who is the physician caring for and what are those stories about? And so that really drew me into medicine. It was the stories first and, and, and the science second. Over time, this led to me sort of reading other books when I was in medical school and residency, probably what I should have been studying. Uh, but instead, I was I was reading about, um, you know, people in rural England or, uh, you know, stories about being a country doctor in Maine. And uh, this really inspired me along the way. And so perhaps as we think about this, when we have our low moments in our careers, might books like this inspire us again. And for those in medical school or residency who are having ups and downs, might these books inspire folks the same way they, they, they inspired me? I tend to keep a bunch of these books on my uh, bookshelf in my office. And sometimes for a certain student, we'll select one of these. Sometimes they're like the books I just showed you, like Bergesi's Cutting for Stone, but other times it's Raymond Carver and, and poems. So it just depends on, on who the student is and, and, and what the issue is. Um, and of course, I just pull these off um, to remind myself sometimes of, of these great works. But there's more than just books, obviously. And so I think I started getting interested in art. Uh, this this again here is, is actually at the Worcester Art Museum. Um, there are stories of others um, that are our colleagues in, in something like Pulse, which is an online journal. But I've always been drawn to um, to the plays um, over time with, with podcasts. The Nocturnist, if you've never listened to it, is just wonderful stories of someone giving a story up on stage and then being interviewed afterwards. Um, so, so lots and lots. Um, and for me, what this comes down to is when I think about what makes a good medical provider, uh, whether that's a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, a medical assistant, a physician, these three traits uh, have to be there or either we won't be all that good a provider, or, and, and or, um, we probably won't make it through our careers. And so when I think of curiosity, um, this quote here from Atul Gawande, ask an unscripted question, listen, learn something, make a human connection, keep conversations going. You start to remember the people you see instead of letting them blur together. And sometimes you discover the unexpected. When he wrote this, he talked about asking one of his nurses about her earlier life and found out that she had been a groupie for Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> he thought that was an incredible thing to find out with an unscripted question. But again, when we're teaching students and they're taking their seven cardinals, if they don't go off script and dig in a little 
and tell me more. And then what happened? They don't get the story. So, so pause there for a second to ask yourself, where do you learn curiosity in medical school? And if it's not entirely clear, then we're going to need some other means to do that. And that's where I'm going to propose the humanities. And, and for all of us, as we get stale, how do we, how do we get ourselves excited about the curiosity again? If you just use textbooks to treat people with no creativity, you'll get the diagnosis, but people won't carry out the plan is what I've found. So this quote here from Danielle Offrey, patients and diseases do not come as prepackaged widgets. A slavish approach to standardized treatments without any creativity can do more harm than good. How many times have I had to ask a patient about their life, figure out what they do every day at the same time, and then couple their medications to that. Literally having a person put their medication with, with, with a, a rubber band around their TV converter so that when they get up in the morning to watch the news, they take their pill. Um, we have to have creativity. And lastly, we have to have love. And I borrowed this quote from the end of the email of Sarah Shields, a colleague of mine. And it says, ultimately, the secret of quality is love. You have to love your patient. You have to love your profession. You have to love your God. If you have love, you can then work backward to monitor and improve the system. I would add to this that you have to love yourself. You have to love the work you do. You have to give yourself compassion. But if you have all of that, if you are really loving your work, then, then you will be a better physician. Patients will have better outcomes and you will thrive. And if you love your work, you'll be more curious and more creative. If you're more curious, you'll be more creative and you'll love it more. It really is a mixed bag. So I, I hope if, if you leave with nothing else tonight, it's, it's these three themes, but let, let's think about how we get there. For me, when I looked at this book in medical school, it was then that I really understood what people were talking about, the art and science, not just the science of medicine. And I, I think I'm probably the only person who ever read this book cover to cover as a medical student, just because I, I just found it so amazing, the history behind what we do. And I've corrected so many people when they do parts of the physical exam wrong, because you know that, that's how they said it in Germany, but that doesn't translate to, to English and things like that. But it was really this art and science that, that really inspired me. So, so moving to this idea of how are we going to exercise our creativity and our curiosity and our love muscles, um, think about medical humanities for a second. Pause for a second and think what comes to mind for you when you think of medical humanities. So I'm going to provide a list here and see if this some of the things on this list were what you were thinking about, whether it was more audio and, and podcasts and TED Talks, or do you like to read poetry or novels? Um, do you like to write a little bit? Do you do your own uh, storytelling? Um, or, or, or take that story and perform it. Um, and, and there's a, a balance there between the two. But there's other ways of thinking about this. I, I know we have history buffs amongst us and, and people who maybe even get into things that are, are less traditional. If we're missing something here, think about that. Um, I would love to continue to expand this list of what we do with learners. So the question, do they really help? I'm not going to get into a lot of of science here, but I am going to say that there are many, many studies that show that, for example, the visual arts can provide strategies to mitigate stress, um, can, can promote our brains to, to stay, stay sort of neuroplastic. The visual arts have improved critical thinking, visual literacy, honed, honed observation skills. This is a, a slide put together by a colleague of mine, Sherilyn Sethi. Um, so, so, so think about that. People have gone to the extent of, of trying to prove this kind of thing. Every year, the Health Humanities uh, Baccalaureate Programs Group, there's, there's over 100 of these at, at an undergraduate level, puts out a book. And in that, they outline the benefits of health humanities education. And in that, with footnotes, they remind us that those who, who study health humanities turn out to be more empathetic communicate better, more patient-centered, and relate to others. I guess it's no wonder when you're just constantly bathing yourself, learning about other cultures, learning about where someone comes from a different place than you, that that would be, be the case. 
But these same students who, who don't just focus on pre-medicine, but focus on health humanities, go into more leadership roles, more medical honor society, and do more service as medical students. So again, there's something to this that keeps us grounded, that keeps us human. And as we sometimes worry about our students, our residents, ourselves, going off the tracks a little bit, starting with such humanity and losing it along the way, is this a way to retain it? Is this a way to hang on to um, the better part of ourselves? So for our medical school, as, as we look at this, and I'll, I'll talk about our group in a minute, but for those of us who think this is really important, we think about this idea of noticing the unnoticeable. Um, this, this deep looking, as Ron Epstein would say, where when you look at, for, 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 um, for example, a painting or a photo, and you really look at it and you really notice, might you do the same in the room? Um, I remember being videotaped as a resident and I didn't even notice that I wasn't including the, 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 the partner of the person I was talking to. If I keep working on noticing the unnoticeable, that's the type of thing I hope my brain starts to do. Really getting a sense of where people are coming from. If we are going to break down the barriers of inequities, if we're going to be more inclusive, we have to understand I'm a six foot three white male from Canada who grew up in a rural white area. How am I to know so many other lives that are, that are here? But if I read about it through, through poetry, through, through novels, if I watch film, is there a chance that I can become more humanistic than I would have been otherwise? We talked about the creativity. And so almost again, bathing ourselves in that creativity around us, but, but having a go at it pushing ourselves to be more reflective um, in ways helps us then to take that creativity into care. When we do lessons with residents to try in, in the museum to work together with a piece of artwork, we start to see that they notice things and they come up with solutions, diagnoses to the artwork as a team that they didn't come up with themselves. And so I think this can really teach teamwork and then again, just sort of adjusting that lens, um, this picture on the left is a little blurry, but start to have ways of seeing. So William Carlos Williams said, outside, outside myself, there is a world, one of my favorite quotes. And, and when I read Amanda Gorman's work, when I watch this film, Roma, when I go over to the Worcester Art Museum and deeply look at this painting and deeply look at it, with residents and listen to what they see in this and, and hear someone with a completely different background of mine see something very different in this painting than I see, then, then I start to, to learn about that world outside myself. The ACGME says we need to teach professionalism and inter interpersonal skills. We need to have efforts to enhance the meaning that each resident finds in the experience of being a physician. These are also things that we can garner through teaching and, and meshing ourselves in, in, in medical humanities. So if we need to turn this around for the ACGME, we can, but I've sort of pointed out the real reasons for me and, and our team at, at, at UMass. And then there's faculty benefits. So I do this work with Sarah Shields and in the past with uh, Sherilyn Sethi. There are other folks in our department and Shannon West is a medical student um, who has helped us with this. But it, but just teaching this is fun and invigorating. And we learn so much about our learners when they write reflective pieces, when they comment on pieces of artwork. Um, we revitalize our way of seeing and our notice the un unnoticeable. So if you're not using this in teaching, you too can have, you know, the fun that we get to have. I feel like I, I feel guilty not sharing that. So there, there are definite faculty benefits to being on that side of it. And we are, we are trying to come up in the, in the new pathways um, at UMass with humanities uh, infused into it. And I'll show you some other examples of what we're doing there. So observation is a powerful tool. It is really important. That's part of why I, I like the humanities so much. So I'm going to pause here for a second and I'm going to... Um, bring up, I'm going to reshare my screen.
and I'm going to share it and try and attempt to show you a video here. So I have turned everything up on, so you should be able to hear this. And so this is just a couple minutes of a clip about how important observation is, and only someone like uh, Ibrahim Verghese can, can, can get this right. We're losing a ritual that I believe is transformative, transcendent, and is at the heart of the patient-physician relationship. This may actually be heresy to say this at TED, but I'd like to introduce you to the most important innovation, I think, in medicine to come in the next 10 years, and that is the power of the human hand to touch, to comfort, to diagnose, and to bring about treatment. I'd like to introduce you first to this person, whose image you may or may not recognize. This is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Since we're in Edinburgh, I'm a big fan of Conan Doyle. You might not know that Conan Doyle went to medical school here in Edinburgh, and his character, Sherlock Holmes, was inspired by Sir Joseph Bell. Joseph Bell was an extraordinary teacher by all accounts. And Conan Doyle, writing about Bell, described the following exchange between Bell and his students. So picture Bell sitting in the outpatient department, students all around him, patients signing up in the emergency room and being registered and being brought in. And a woman comes in with a child and Conan Doyle describes the following exchange. The woman says, good morning. Bell says, what sort of crossing did you have on the ferry from Burnt Island? She says, it was good. And he says, what did you do with the other child? She says, I left him with my sister at Leith. And he says, and did you take the shortcut down Inverleith Row to get here to the infirmary? She says, I did. And he says, would you still be working at the linoleum factory? And she says, I am. And Bell then goes on to explain to the students. He says, you see, when she said good morning, I picked up her Fife accent, and the nearest ferry crossing from Fife is from Burnt Island, and so she must have taken the ferry over. You notice that the coat she's carrying is too small for the child who is with her, and therefore she started out the journey with two children, but dropped one off along the way. You notice the clay on the soles of her feet. Such red clay is not found within 100 miles of Edinburgh, except in the botanical gardens, and therefore she took a shortcut down Inverley Row to arrive here. And finally, she has a dermatitis on the fingers of her right hand, a dermatitis that is unique to the linoleum factory workers in Burnt Island. And when Bell actually strips the patient, begins to examine the patient, you can only imagine how much more he would discern. And as a teacher of medicine, as a student myself, I was so inspired by that story. But you might not realize that our ability to look into the body in this simple way, using our senses, is quite recent. The I'm going to pause there. Um, I hope that that vignette of, of, uh, from that TED Talk inspired you the way uh, it inspires me a and our students. Um, we show this to our students every year. Let me zoom from here. So this is the participatory part of this talk, uh, which I'm not sure uh, most speakers would risk, but um, in order in order for us to really get a sense of what I mean about this, let's let's give it a go. Um, so here here is a painting. You don't technically need to know who it's by or or what the medium was um, for this to be helpful. You don't need to have any art history background at all. The question I, I pose to you all is, first of all, what do you see? Um, and, and start with just observation, what you see. Try not to formulate a diagnosis. Try not to formulate the story yet. Just what you see. If you want to type anything into the chat as to what you're seeing, that would be helpful for others to see. Okay, awesome. Woman and a baby on the beach. That is exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> Not, nothing more. Rough seas, a storm. Thank you. Windy beach, a strong wind and seas. Now, Dr. Matz was the first to go from what he sees to a little interpretation. 
fortitude in the face of fear. <laughs> I see baby is bundled up, running with the child. Yeah. So, so we start with just what we see before we make any interpretation. But it's it's so difficult to do. Now, what do you what do you think is going on? And so again, coming back to Dr. Metz, you know, there's there's some kind of fortitude and there's some kind of fear. So there, there's something going on. You could even start to go even a little further if you wish. And if you want to unmute for a second, if that's easier, if you want to put something into the chat. The first word that popped into my mind when I saw this was strength. Thank you. So mother and child undergoing a treacherous journey. Great. Leaving danger. Excellent. So, so where are they going or where are they coming from? Um, just again, some more thoughts of, of shade and dark. Uh, just noticing that. Great. We don't know if the artist meant that to be something about the emotion or if that, you know, I mean, sometimes sort of kind of Shakespearean where the weather imitates what's happening to the to the characters. The fortitude that is most realized when protecting your child or loved one. I love that. Um, that is one of the strongest loves and, and, and protective devices, isn't it? Mother as protector, even in the face of something way bigger than herself, searching for something. Great. Child appears alarmed by the wind and the storm. Yeah. Right, just those eyes, right? All, all you need are the eyes. We've learned that during during COVID. <laughs> the child has a mask of sorts on. Huh? Right, okay. Determination to protect yet move forward to ch face challenges. All right, so what's interesting here is different people are coming up with different scenarios, right? So we, we have to stop for a second and think about our, our team and how our team sees something very different than us and how helpful that could be. Now I want you to try to just choose one word. Um, and, and, and we've already had one person uh, unmute and do that. Can you choose one word? And earlier I saw the word courage. Unafraid. Fortitude, determination. Resilience, great, strength. Uncertainty, thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody for, 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 for participating in this. this. This one image gives us the ability to learn so much about each other. Um, when Warren Ferguson says, what is she going from? I'm thinking, you know, Warren thinks that way. He, he thinks that a woman may have to run from someone. That's, that's really important. Um, when someone talks about resilience, you know, what does that say about the person who sees resilience versus fear? You know, where, where are each of us coming from? So we can learn about each other. We can learn from each other. Um, and again, it doesn't really matter what this uh, piece of art is really about. Um, this, this is uh, a Homer Winslow piece. This is called The Gale. Um, and, 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 and it's thought that this person is waiting for the return of her loved one. In fact, this storm, this water splashing up on the side is actually covering a ship that used to be there in the original version of this and now is not there. But for our pur pur purposes, it, again, it doesn't really matter if we had the docent here explaining more and more about this to us. I learned from what you all just did and that, that can be enough. Um, uh, so I, I, hope, I hope you can see some of the benefits of that. When we, when we do go to the Worcester Art Museum, we start off with that art of observation and sometimes just get people to use one word. When you enter into a room, sometimes you have to decide pretty quickly what's going on. Um, if you're in an urgent situation or what have you. And so sometimes one word can be quite powerful. Um, so we, we start with the art of observation and then it's art of observation and communication. And we, we take this middle paint, painting for example and get people to work to tell the story and they work as a team. And yet, what do you notice? And what don't you notice and things? And then we go to art of self-reflection and we have residents um, actually pick a painting that appeals to them and they talk about why. And it's amazing what comes out of that. 
And so these are just over three workshops, um, what you can do in a place like the Worcester Art Museum. So looking and commenting, reflecting and explaining and self-disclosing. So I'm going to I'm going to change gears now because I didn't want everything just to be about artwork and and go to writing. And I, so I'm not going to get to all the various things, but I want to talk a little bit about writing as a healer because I think it's something even those of us like myself who who would never be able to paint anything well, although I could still paint to express myself, writing comes a little easier to me so I think people have to find what works for them. For me, the story has really been lost in the electronic health record. It, what's there doesn't represent what happened between the patient and I. Um, as I told you, I love the story. That's why I came to doctoring. And it really reminds me of the best of what we do. And so for me to be able to go home at the end of the day and write something down that actually took place, I get to take the story back from the electronic health record. Um, and maybe some of those who are losing ourselves in the electronic health record could, could, could find that to be helpful as well. Atul Gawande, in his five rules commencement speech that later went into his book Better, I believe, said, my rule number four is write something. It makes no difference whether you write a paper for a medical journal, five paragraphs for a website, or a collection of poetry. Try to put your name in print at least once a year. What you write does not need to achieve perfection. It only needs to add some small observation about our world. Furthermore, by putting your writing out to an audience, even a small one, you connect yourself to something larger than yourself. Um, I, I think this is so true, and we don't all have to become published authors, but we can become either people who share with a small community or just sharing with ourselves. Um, and that's coming back to that gratitude journaling that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention in a second. So here are some pieces that I have been able to publish in, in smaller journals or on an online journal. Um, but it was enough that I got to reflect on what happened in my office with a woman who had palpitations that turned out to be anxiety. Um, or what happened between a mother and a son as, as this grown man who had Down syndrome was dying and, and what the effect it had on me as a medical student. Um, so, so, and, and, and I've got a hundred more of these on my computer that never see the light of day, but it helps me to process. And sometimes as Atul Gawande said, when I share it with others, I think it puts it out there and, 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 and then, and then you, you have a conversation about it. What I've tried to do is actually go from writing myself to getting other people to write. And we have this listserv that goes out weekly called the Family Medicine Moments. It lives right now on the uh, UMass Chan Medical School Library website. But we're going to be updating it and evolving it so people can search by topic. We've been doing this now, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think 14 years. And every week, except for the summer, someone from our department, which includes alumni and uh, residents and medical students, community docs, writes something that happened to them that week that they're either proud of or had uh, an impact on them. Sometimes it comes as a story. Sometimes it comes as a photo. Sometimes it comes as um, a poem, a haiku. Um, it's taken various uh, different, different media. And, um, and people read it and respond. And authors get all of these different you know, feedback on what they wrote. And it connects us as a community, even though this has been virtual for 14 years, long before the pandemic. People connect through this. And, and I tried to study it at one point and found that this helped, you know, for those who read it every week versus just like a few times a year, it inspired the study and practice of medicine. Um, it, people learned more about patients' social cultural backgrounds by reading other people's stories. Uh, people increase their level of compassion for patients and their families by reading someone else's story from our department. And it helped them feel more connected to their colleagues. So this may be something other departments want to try. And it doesn't have to be weekly. It could be monthly. It could be quarterly. Um, but this, this little bit of local writing has, has been pretty uh, powerful. So think about it for a minute. If you were to write a patient's story, what, what would you write about? What, what moved you today or recently that you're thinking, hey, I, I think I, I might want to write about that? Um, you, can either, you can either put a topic into the chat or you can just... Just muse on that for a minute.
And I know there are some of us uh, here tonight who have heard stories either for themselves or, or they've published them. Um, so while you're thinking on that, I want to suggest the statistics that I recall. The entering classes are actually 56%. Oh, I wasn't sure if someone's trying to make a comment or not. Okay. <laughs> As you're as you're thinking about how you might write, I want to I want to suggest some very simple ways to do this because we're all very busy. You literally can write a haiku, <laughs> five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. It's amazing what people will write in that short little uh, that short powerful piece, a six word story. Um, we've done this with residents, and we can we can tap into exactly where they are in their sort of emotional highs and lows in six words. Um, but there's also something called the 55 word story, a little bit longer and yet still pretty tight. You have to count your words and, and edit it down, um, but, but that can be fun. So those ones are all very short, but you also <clears throat> obviously could try, you know, your hand at some poetry or, or something a little longer. Um, but I want to suggest those little ones. Sometimes they're just enough at the end of the day or on a weekend to, to keep you going. So where can you start? We've talked about our work. We've talked about writing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, you know, I would, I would say head over to the Worcester Art Museum or head to our museum or just start to, to notice photos and art a little different than you were before this talk. Slow down, do it with someone else, go back and forth. I've taken my daughter to the Worcester Art Museum and looked at some of the paintings uh, that we looked at with the residents and shot, she saw things very differently. And, and that, that really helped me to think about um, the way I observe. Um, and, and when you're reading, whether it's poems or essays or whatever you like to read, just that little bit of closer reading, that little bit of what did that character actually say? What, what, what does that tell me about where they're coming from? What's on their mind? What, what trauma have they suffered? So that close observation and close reading and writing can then lead to close listening in the office. Using, using that, that, those muscles can lead to what Ron Epstein in his book Attending talks about, where, we, where we're not interrupting anymore. We're not in quite the same hurry. Even though we only have 15 minutes, you can get a lot by just letting that one or two more minutes go and, and not thinking about the next question for a minute. Just, just, just focusing on what the person is saying, which is extremely hard to do because sometimes we're trying to type, sometimes we're trying to move, think about the next question. But when we just focus on the patient, it is amazing how we get so much more information and we probably don't need as many questions. And then paying attention to those inflections. And I, and I think it is Dr. Metz who, who really taught those of us who are learning community mentors to suggest to our students, as you're taking the history, look around the room, watch the patient's face. Are they grimacing? Are they smiling? Um, what else is in the room? Are there, are, are, is, there, is there a photo of someone? Is there a card from someone? Are there flowers? Um, be present to what is going on in the room. Bring all that back to your bring that curiosity back to your creativity um, and, and ultimately you'll be able to, to help the patient more. So this is, this, is, this is why I think this produces better medicine. And at the end of the day, you go home having a better sense of accomplishment. This is a kind of a cycle because as you start to do close listening, then you might want to do some writing because you've really taken in the story. So Henry Del Rosario is in, in uh, my department, uh, family medicine, uh, our department, and uh, and he has um, his own sort of portfolio and blog. And so if you want to see someone who's done this well, where they're doing writing, where they're taking photos, where they're reflecting, um, his is a great one. If you just Google Henry Del Rosario, you'll find his, his work, hopefully. Lisa Gusick is another person who I have really come to admire with her ability to take incredible photos just with her phone and talk about close observing, zooming in on frost. Um, and and I, I wouldn't have thought to take that picture that way. I, mean, I can't look at things that she has taken a picture of the same way anymore, which gets me changing the way I think and look at things. This is what our uh, UMass uh, Chan Medical School 
medical humanities lab looks like. It's not a physical lab, but it, it we, we, we meet monthly. And we think about, you know, is there enough reflective writing in the clerkships? And and how does how does reflective writing and, and, and reflecting think about he, healers are, I'm sorry, I don't have Becky's full name in there. Um, and we have a writing contest and the writing contest gets more writing going. And there are medical humanities electives and writing electives that Dave Hatem does. And some of the students created a blog and now there is a storytelling mechanism through MedMoth. Um, and I mentioned my family medicine moments and all of this energy here in the middle is leading to Dr. Lalakos and, and some students doing art for physicians. And um, there's a podcast that Dr. Green and some students now oversee called Murmurs. And, um, and, and, and we're just about to launch a music and medicine elective. So, so this is all like moving along organically. If you want to be a part of this, we would love to have people uh, join us. Um, this is what some of those things look like. The podcast in the middle there, Murmurs, the blog, the interstitium, the med moth night, um, sort of kind of like the moth in NPA. And, and 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 this is what our lab looks like virtually. Um, and again, reach out to me if you want to learn more or, or if you have some some talent you'd like to bring to inspire students, we would love to have that. So I want to I want to end this with reminding you what is all around us. Um, and I've, I've made a plug for the Art Museum a few times now, but um, when you go there, you're like, you know, they, they have this. Uh, I didn't know they had Andy Warhol here. This is great. So there, there's incredible materials there. Um, and here are just a few um, uh, a few artists, like Dagen and Eakins and, and Monet and, and Cassette, and, and, and there's so many others there. So, um, you know, please, it, it's a real gem. Um, the Hanover Theater, if you haven't gone there to watch a play, to hear music, to see a comedian, um, incredible. Um, and I'm going, I'm going to hint to you how to save money to go to these things, but also how you can suggest this to your patients, believe it or not. Um, but if you want to venture outside the city to, to Fitchburg, to the uh, Fitchburg Art Museum, um, in the right upper corner there, that's Holy Cross's uh, uh, museum. And uh, down at the bottom there is the Museum of Russian Icons in uh, Clinton, Massachusetts. So all very interesting museums. But just, just, just look up, uh, do the opposite of that movie, don't look up, and look around the city, the, the murals that have uh, been produced in our city, that have, that the Worcester Art Council actually puts out every year grants for artists to do more artwork. Um, this, this one in the bottom here, uh, with the Boston Red Sox here, um, is new literally in the last few days, and it was in the paper this week, so so there's lots of, of murals just to, to notice and make our, our city more happy and vibrant. The Mass Medical Society has a member interest network um, around nature, culture, and history. Um, and it's, it actually goes by the name of Arts, History, Humanism, and Culture Member Interest Network. Um, on the right here is an upcoming uh, virtual program they're going to have November 1st with music and art by members. So. Um, you it's probably too late to join uh, to get your work in there, but you could you could attend and and take this in. So, so that's at the Mass Medical Society level, at the Worcester District Medical Society level, in the um, the uh, in print uh, for Worcester Medicine. Um, there's the As I See It, where you can you can write an essay. There's the every year they actually print the essay contest winners from the med school, and then. Um, uh, Dr. McGee often has, uh, you know, history of medicine that, that that's kind of cool to, to take in. So we have our own little bits of humanities um, right right around us. So I'll end with this idea of a humanities prescription. Um, hopefully, first you're writing the prescription to yourself to get out there and and see and do and and partake a little more. But if you wanted to with your patients, I often suggest my patients go to the library because there are so many things that they can check out in terms of books. And if they don't have the book, they can get it from the whole network around the state. But um, depending on if they still use DVDs, they can get film um, and on and on it goes, programs for art and things. With the museum, the first Sunday of the month is free. Um, and so if, if you're wanting your patient to be inspired, um, and, and, and they need something like that, the first Sunday is free. And at the Hanover Theater, there's the new card to culture. 
Um, so if someone has SNAP and an EBT card, they can watch plays for $8. And so, um, and they can get up to four tickets. So that's something that people may not have known that I'm gonna start to think about uh, for, for some folks who need that. In fact, this culture prescription initiative by the Mass Cultural Council is looking at some communities and prescribing different types of, of art. Um, and there's even programs coming that are gonna be art in a box where someone gets to take home things and work on it. And of, and of course, there's a whole, as you know, work on art therapy. Um, so these are these are um, ideas to think about. But you could share a, a poem, and I said, definitely have done that with patients when they're talking about something and it, it, it draws back to something. And I'm like, I think what you're saying is this, and I'll make a photocopy of it and they'll take it home. And when they come back the next time, we'll talk about it. It's rare, but when it happens, I think it can be pretty cool. I've done that with a book. I've done that with a, an essay. Um, the people who have had patients draw things, and I, I will never forget being a part of group prenatal care and having women draw their birth before it happened. And the things that you learned when someone like, there was technology everywhere in one in one photo, and I, I, that was so sad. But that, that's what that person was sort of expecting and afraid of. And, and the next person just had themselves, and there was no one else in the room. And when we pointed that out, they said, "Oh yeah, that's right. My husband will be there, and a doctor." But they had it, you know, that they were ready. So, so that kind of thing, getting people to draw. Um, Robert Coles did this with children all the time, and and it was amazing the stuff that came up. And then. I've, I've mentioned gratitude journals so many times, but for our patients and for ourselves, we, we have to learn to pat ourselves on the back. That is a form of writing that um, that is essential. And if it's just a few minutes a day, a few minutes a week, a few minutes a month, something where we just slow down and appreciate ourselves. Um, our, the Northeast is far, far too busy and, and, and it's important. So, all right. So, so I hope you'll consider joining our Humanities Lab if that's the kind of thing you're into. Um, if, if not, or if so, write something and please visit the, the, the local museum. Um, and I'm gonna pause there um, so that we can see if there's any questions or thoughts or, or comments. So <clears throat> Dr. Silk, that was a wonderful talk. Um, and very inspiring. This is Giles Whalen. And I wonder, you know, in the pressure that of time that, uh, that, that actually saps a lot of this energy, uh, what your thoughts are about encouraging people not only to listen to the story the patients are telling them, but also to write a note that speaks to, um, speaks to what the issues were that they were seeing the patient for and how the patient told them that and what their the more generic humanistic conclusions they draw from it rather than, you know, what happens mostly these days is a, is a, a template with a data dump uh, from everything else in the chart. And we've gotten away from it to the point where I think it's really quite destructive. Uh, uh, and I wonder if that might not be the most effective writing. I always felt that if you could, if you can mix the two things you're doing, if you're seeing a patient, and talking to them, or better yet, listening to them, that if you can write the story that they told you, which is the story of their disease and their problem, that you often can produce a much better note in a much shorter period of time than, uh, than you do by, by these enormous notes that actually you finish it or no wiser about what happened. So yeah. uh, comments yeah. on that. Well, you know, Look, there, there's times when I, I get it. We're we're really in a hurry, and a pa patient is there for a really focused thing. And and you know, all of us know there's times when we make up for our day by being in and out of that room. And and that's probably still does a disservice to someone. But I, but I get that. But there's times when David Lockster Camp, uh, family doctor in Maine, wrote that there's times when we're we're, we're going to write for another lab, or we're going to write for another prescription, and we're going to do something so we can get out of that room. And, and we know the right thing to do is to just stay and listen and talk a little more. And, and we wouldn't have to do that extra prescription or that extra test. Um, there's times when I, I, I get to a point with patients where I know them a little better. And so the diabetes check and the hypertension check and things, are, that's the easy part. So 
that's a time when I start to listen more and get to know this person even more. In terms of that making it into the note, um, gosh, it's tricky, right? We're all just trying to get our notes done as quickly as possible. And some of our billing has changed where we don't have to put down as much and we get paid for time if, if we wish. But I, I often, I, I work in an office where I get to listen to Eric Garcia um, dictate and, and boy, does he put some of the story in there. And I, I'm just always like, uh, in awe that he that he does that but he you know he he, he you know he dictates into his phone that goes go, goes into their it goes into the electronic health record and and so there is more of the patient there and for many many homeless uh, patients who are experiencing homelessness that that element of the story is what you really need and so i guess we need to maybe triage a little bit pick and choose and that social history that's that's in there is gold as opposed to your right 15 page printout that's got nothing of use. So yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm just gonna look at the, the chat for a second. So um, I, I'm seeing how would one join the Humanities Lab? If you just email me, I'll help connect you. Um, the, the Peabody Essex Museum, Becky Spanigal, that was Becky when it said that on my thing and I forgot to put Dr. Spanigal. So thank you for, for, for adding that as a choir member, thank you. Yes, we 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 don't do enough music and medicine, but we are trying to evolve that. Um, okay, did I? And then uh, so Peter Matz, yeah, art is a way to the soul and to our connection with others. But there is such diversity of other options as well. Yes, thank you. I chose to focus on art and writing tonight, but I do not want to uh, diminish the others. Um, I've never read a patient's obituary when something was a surprise to me, always reminded me that I had, I had work to do to listen better. Yeah, I think that's a really, really great point. Um, I, I, I find that challenging. I, I try to go to wakes and funerals of my patients. Um, and when I learn a lot there, I realize, gosh, I, I could have learned a lot more beforehand. So thanks. Thanks for that one. Um, there's something here about scribes. Okay, uh, Linda Cregan runs a scribe program. So thank you for allowing scribes in the new UMass Medical Scribe Fellowship to attend this evening. This reinforces some of the academic enrichment sessions we provide. So this idea of, of using the scribe, going back to Dr. Williams' point, to, to maybe write a little bit more about the patient in there in the right place, I think is, is great. Okay. Uh, Student Wellness Committee, yes. So uh, if you, if on one of the diagrams I had there, we were trying to show that the Student Wellness Committee was a part of that uh, Venn diagram. And, and we really, uh, the students have been saying, we need to have this kind of stuff, which is how MedMoth and things like that uh, evolved. Um, other questions or comments? You can either put up your hand or unmute. I had a wonderful mentor named Judah Falkman, who was uh, a surgeon at children's hospitals for year for you know for many many years. And his he always used to say that the human mind is hardwired to learn by stories. And so uh, I think it's probably the most effective education we have are stories rather than um, than many of the uh, what you call the textbook knowledge that we go through. It, it really gets embedded in people's brains as a story as to what what matters and how things really work. Um, uh, so I think this is actually a critical mission. You're yeah, I think when we think about diversity and inclusion and health inequities, um, if we just bring the patient's story to our teaching, to our office, suddenly people change the way they're thinking about that issue. Uh, we recently had a launch of our Road to Care, which is a mobile unit for medical care around Worcester and, and really focusing on um, people with substance use uh, issues. And, and each of us got up and politicians got up and spoke and, 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 and they were all you know inspiring and good, but then a patient got up and a patient talked about what the, what the, what the mobile unit meant to her. And, and, and I, you know, everybody just went silent, right? Like that's the story. Um, so, so we really need to, to, to keep bringing that to the work we do. Um, I know this was meant to be about an hour long, so I know we're coming up against that, but I don't, if somebody has a comment or a question, um, we can go a couple minutes over.
I'm going to put my um, email again into the uh, chat. And so if someone missed that at the end of my talk, you can get a hold of me, hugh.silk at umassmemorial.org, if you want to find out more about the work you're doing. Joel, are you, uh, you've got a comment. Thanks, uh, Hugh. It was a, a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I, my, my question is this: I, the, 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 what, what you're speaking about in terms of curiosity, creativity, and love, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it's just absolutely essential. The problem is that that I faced as as a program director for 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 many years. Um, and, and I think the most challenging was when residents or students, for that matter, didn't seem to have intellectual curiosity. I couldn't really say that I inspired it very well. I think occasionally, very occasionally, I broke through. But, you know, sort of taking a step back, how, how do you inspire that in the first place? You, I mean, you, you, you get them, you, you got to get them to the museum. You got to get them in you know, first. They got to get their foot in the door. I, I don't know how to take that first step. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When, when we were children, um, there, there were some people who forced books upon us and said, you got to read more. And, and you'd just be like, I do not want to read this book. I'll do anything not to read this book. And then there was the wise people who said, hey, what do you want to read? Uh, how about a comic book? Read a comic book. Great. Here's a comic book. You know, um, and, and so, you know, we need to figure out what what does inspire our learners who, you know, we, we can judge our medical care by the way we care for the toughest and most difficult patients. We could probably judge our teaching by how we connect with the toughest learners. Um, nobody comes into this wanting to be a tough learner. Uh, there, there's something there that that someone is inspired by an interest they have. I think we, once again, we probably need to sit down and take just a few more minutes to find out what that is and start with that. Um, the nice thing you said, Joel, about when you go to the museum and and, and you, you you get creative and say, go find the painting you like. We've showed you six paintings, but they, you might not like any of those. Go find the one you like, and then let's talk about that. And what about that? Oh, tell me more. So where, where in your life experience did that become exciting? Wow. Okay. So when you think about that patient you saw last week that had pain that was extreme and you knew nothing about them, but you know a lot about this. Okay. So let's see if we can find a connection. That That's when I think we start to get people inspired and interested. But it, take, it takes time. <laughs> None of us have enough time, but it takes time. Thanks again. Great presentation. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks everyone so, for your wonderful comments, both publicly so and really, both publicly and privately. So it really was wonderful, uh, Hugh. It was. It was. It, it. It connects us back, as you say, to the reasons that we all took up this line of work. I think ultimately in in whatever specialty. Um, so I really want to thank you. Um, I'm going to remind everybody that our own. You know, Worcester District Medical Society humanist uh, Dale McGee, who's running the, runs basically everything: history of medicine, public health, and so forth. Has a has a um, uh, an event on for f the Founders Day at Mechanics Hall on the history of poliomyelitis from the past up till now and how it fits. And there are a lot of stories in that. And Dale is pretty good at that. So it's a good, it's our next event. It's a good follow on. I want to thank everybody for coming. This was a terrific uh, reminder of the what the, the, the beating heart of medicine actually is. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.